Can I tell you a story? Once upon a time, a man wanted to buy some land. He went down to the office, spoke to his attorney, picked out the parcel of land. But unfortunately, as the attorney looked it over, he said, don't buy this land. This is reserved for a big battle in 1864. Well, that's a really improbable story. That's a fable. That would be a fairy tale with about as much sense as glass slippers in it. It didn't happen that way. But why did I tell you that little make-believe story, aside from trying to get your attention? Because sometimes we have an idea that the battlefields of the American Civil War had been marked out as battlefields. The people knew there would be fighting there, but that's not the case. The fields where armies in blue and gray clashed during the Civil War years were the farms, the fields, the streets, the backyards of citizens and communities. Sure, there were some battles that were fought off in the wilderness or on mountains where maybe no one was doing much agriculture or um, had many homes, but generally speaking, the battles were fought in communities. Today, I want to take you on a historical journey to a community where a battle was fought in May 1864. I'm Sarah K. Byerly with Gazette 66.5, and in today's video, we're talking about the town and community of Newmarket, Virginia, and how the battle fought there on May 15, 1864, changed that community. First off, let's look at some maps. Last week, we talked about the Shenandoah Valley. You should be able to find that video pretty easily on our YouTube channel. This week, we want to narrow in our focus and look at the community of Newmarket. But first off, you're going to have to know where the place is. So, here's a look at a map of the Shenandoah Valley, and I've circled Newmarket. Now that you've seen the location of Newmarket in the Shenandoah Valley, let's look a little closer at the topography of the area. Here is another map designed by Hal Jesperson. Did you notice that Newmarket is a crossroads town and that it has some rising ground or hills out to the west? That's going to be on the farther left-hand side of the map. Well, there's Shirley's Hill, there's Manor's Hill, then there's, there's this area that we now call the Plateau, and then there's the Bashong's Hill. And those are going to be important pieces of high ground in the battle that unfolds here in the community on May 15, 1864. Now that we've looked at a little bit of the location and the topography, let's talk about the town itself. Newmarket. How did it get the name? Well, it was actually named after a location in England. And here's the really cool thing. Both the town in England and the original colonial town that got this name of Newmarket, both of them had racetracks. So Newmarket starts off as a little horse racing crossroads community. When did it come into being? Let's get this right. 1796, the General Assembly of Virginia formally established the town of Newmarket. Now, settlers had been settling or building their homes and the community in the area a few decades prior to. But it's 1796 when the town becomes official, and it's officially Newmarket. Now, the town grew and prospered in the early decades of the 19th century. In 1835, a Virginia newspaper published an excerpt about the town of Newmarket, and some of the things they included in the articles were details. In 1835, the town was three quarters of a mile long. Pretty nice stroll if you wanted to walk end to end and back. At that time, there were just over a hundred houses in the Crossroads community, and about 700 people lived there. The article also noted that there were a number of factories in the area. Now these aren't factories like the type of industrialized factories that were making cloth and shoes and things like that farther up in the north. 
these were manufactory shops that were producing a variety of items, mostly farming equipment. But still, Newmarket is a bustling community. They're providing goods to the other towns and farmers who are in the area. Time of the 1860s census, we get some really important details that give us a background for understanding this community just on the eve of the Civil War. According to the 1860 census records, there were 1,422 people living in Newmarket when the, the, the official census count was taken. Now, of those people, um, 55 were freed African Americans, probably doing um, hired out work or owning their own businesses there in the community. 79 of the number were enslaved. So when we look at the records from 1835 to 1860, Newmarket has approximately doubled its population. There now, let's talk politics. I was looking, I wanted to have a I voted pin or sticker or something to put on my sweater at this point, but I couldn't find one in my jewelry box or anywhere. It's been a few months since an election, so we'll just have to talk about politics without the really cool prop. So politics, Shenandoah Valley. This was one thing we didn't really talk about last week. Overall, in the 1860 presidential election, most people, and again we're making a broad generalization here, most people in the Shenandoah Valley kind of wanted things to stay the way they were. They were not fire-eating secessionists, but they weren't really Republicans or in favor of abolition. They're kind of, let's keep things as they are. Many of the counties, um, when we look at the majority of the records, um, we find a lot of counties in the Shenandoah Valley, their majority votes are going toward John Bell, who was running on more of a Constitution Union platform in the 1860 election. Now, having said that, when we come to Shenandoah County, which is where the town of Newmarket sits, there is an exception. So Shenandoah County is kind of different. Not necessarily in a bad way, just in the political way in 1860. So Shenandoah County and the citizens of Newmarket cast the majority of their votes for a Democrat candidate named John C. Breckenridge is very fascinating. It's also very ironic. Here's the deal. In 1864, John C. Breckinridge will be the Confederate general commanding Confederate forces in the Battle of Newmarket. They had no idea in 1860 when they cast their votes that they were voting for a candidate who would lose, who would join the Confederacy, and who would fight a battle in their hometown. History is amazing. Okay, now that we've talked politics, we have to talk militia. So in pre-Civil War America, towns had militia units. It goes back into colonial tradition, it goes back into the Constitution, um, what the framers wrote. It was this idea that communities, counties, states could have an armed force to enforce their laws. Kind of the idea is, if the local sheriff can't handle it, you might have to call out the local militia. That's a generalization of the idea, but hopefully it helps to kind of put the idea into play, into our discussion right now. So, Newmarket had a militia unit. Here's where it gets kind of funny. They called themselves the 10th Legion Artillery. That sounds so impressive, right? 10th Legion Artillery. Here's the funny part. They weren't an artillery unit. Go figure. But the 10th Legion Artillery, which did not have any artillery, actually witnessed some pretty historic events. Anyway, 1859, John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. That scares the Virginians, okay? Governor Wise calls out the state militia, sends a bunch of units up there to um, step in and stop John Brown. Well, one of the militia units that responds to the call and heads up to Harper's Ferry is the 10th Legion of Artillery from Newmarket. 
And those guys go up, they respond to the governor's call, and then they're actually there. They witness the hanging of John Brown, which took place in December of 1859. So these guys from Newmarket and Shenandoah County witness some pretty important happenings in American history. Now, this whole incident in 1859 scares the Virginians. It really scares people in the Shenandoah Valley because they were kind of close to the Harpers Ferry incident. Okay, a hundred miles, give or take, but it was close enough to scare them. So, 1859, 1860, there is huge growth in militia units in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, when the war comes, these militia units will be the backbone of some of the um, Confederate units recruited from the region. This is important to note. For new market history, 1859 is the year they decide to form a second militia unit from Newmarket. They call themselves the Newmarket Cavalry. Now the Newmarket Cavalry, when the war finally comes in 1861, will join Confederate unit and it will become part of Rice's Battery, which is a rather famous um, artillery unit. So the cavalry becomes artillery. It's, it's kind of different. Okay. So we were talking about the New Market community and a little bit of its history and things that some of its citizens had witnessed. So it brings up the question, why New Market? Why does this battle that's fought on May 15th, 1864, end up in this town, in this community? There's hundreds of communities, small town communities in the Shenandoah Valley. Why New Market? All right. There are reasons why battles are fought where they are fought. New Market has two reasons, two reasons why it becomes a battleground. Number one, it's a crossroads town. Number two, New Market Gap. Those three words are probably the most important reason. New Market Gap. Let me explain. So, the Valley Pike runs right through the town of Newmarket, which is very convenient for this bustling community. It's very convenient for their small growing economy. And the houses of the town line the pike. Excellent! You know who comes in and out of town? Life's good in Newmarket. But then the Civil War comes and the armies start using the Valley Pike. So now you have soldiers marching right past your doorstep. In the 1862 Valley Campaign, which we mentioned in last week's video, um, both armies, Union and Confederate, are going to march through New Market, but neither of them hang out in the town or the community for an extended period. So Nathaniel Banks, his guys kind of come through, um, Stonewall Jackson and his army pass through a couple of times as they go back and forth on their Valley Campaign. So New Market has seen Civil War soldiers but they haven't experienced a battle. So we have the town and we have the crossroads. And we get the crossroads because there's a road that goes east-west. The Valley Turnpike is gonna go north-south. And then you have this other road goes east-west. And that east-west road, it's now Route 211, it goes up and over Newmarket Gap. Okay. Raise your hand, or you could even like this video if you remember Massanutten Mountain from last week's discussion. Massanutten Mountain, right. You can stop the video and say that five times fast if you would like to, but I'm going to keep going. The only point that you can cross an army over the mountain is Newmarket Gap. That's really cool, but it also makes the community a targeted area. So if you leave Newmarket and head east, we go up and over New Market Gap and into Luray Valley. That's another part of the Shenandoah Valley, but it's formed by the Blue Ridge and now Massanutten Mountain, so you call it Luray Valley. It's an area where Jackson sent his troops in there and they kind of did these secretive marches north and hit Union armies. And you can do really cool stuff strategically with Massanutten Mountain, but to be really cool and strategic, you have to have New Market Gap because otherwise you're going to have to march all the way back up and around. Does that make sense? Excellent. So, Valley Turnpike, New Market Gap. Is the picture starting to become a little more clear why the armies clashed here? Hopefully. So here's the deal. 
John C. Breckinridge, the Confederate general, Franz Siegel, the Union general, they both need to control Newmarket Gap. Now, Franz Siegel is going to have to march up the valley. Remember, that's marching south in the valley to get to Newmarket. Breckinridge already has some Confederate cavalry and partisans up in that area. So he's kind of technically already in the area, but he also knows the importance of Newmarket Gap. So a clash is set to happen in this community the way the entire campaign is unfolding. Because of these factors, the citizens who live in Newmarket in 1864 are going to experience war firsthand. And it's going to change their lives. Now, I think it's important to not just say the residents of Newmarket or the people who lived in Newmarket. Let's give them names. Let's give them faces. Let's figure out where they lived, where they walked, what they did when war came to town. So I'm going to read off some names and then we're going to show you some pictures of these individuals. Jesse and Solomon Rupert, Eliza Kleindunst, Samuel Henkel, Jacob and Sarah Bouchon, Joseph Strayer, Perry Cook. Now before we wrap up today's video, let's take a little journey through photographs around Newmarket as it appears today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show some pictures. And if you have the chance to visit Newmarket, of course, go visit the battlefield, but try to make some time to go into the town. It's a delightful community. There's a lot to see. You just kind of have to know where to look. And that's where I'd recommend picking up a historic walking tour guide. And you can get those at the Strayer House, maybe some of the other buildings in town. So as you walk along Route 11, which was the old, the Valley Turnpike there running through town, you'll be able to know which houses predate the Civil War, what houses were there during the battle, and you'll even learn more about the residents of the town who were there when the conflict erupted in their streets and fields. Well folks, that is going to be all for today's video. I know I got off on a few tangents there. Um, maybe you will laugh at me and if I made you laugh and smile and have a better day, that's a good thing. Um, hopefully we gave you some things to think about. Definitely some background on this town and this community where the battle happened. And for those of you that are very anxious to get to the military history, I have news for you. We are going to talk military history next week. We're going to start off talking about the armies that fight the Battle of Newmarket. So come learn about the commanders, the units, the command structure, and how they get to the fields of Newmarket. Today, we're wrapping up the discussion about civilians, the town and community of Newmarket. It's sat at a crossroads, literally on the map and also literally in the history books. Thanks so much for joining us for this discussion. I hope you have an inspired week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.